welcome, and uh, I hope you feel free to interrupt what's going on at any time and ask questions, or if something needs clarification, please uh, don't hesitate. M my hope for these kinds of retreats is that it will quickly become so interesting to everyone that the uh, presentational form will transform itself into a dialogue among many people. It seems to me that's when it happens best. And I don't think people would be here if they didn't have strong opinions and ideas about probably everything which is said. So that's the way the group mind is generated by everyone opening up and uh, expressing how they relate to these things that we're going to discuss. I guess the place to start is sort of with looking at the notion that uh, the dawning paradigm of postmodern consciousness seems to be the growing awareness that we don't know what is happening at all, <laughs> that all of the models whose implications have been worked out over the past 500 years or so have come to a place where they are now recursive and they no longer can be pushed forward as models of explanation. In other words, they are completed and ontological analysis of how they work now shows us the limitations of their application to reality. They just simply cannot, there is not more blood to be squeezed from the stone of science. There may be further discoveries, but further growth and understanding along those lines now seems unlikely, what with complementarity principle, Bell's theorem, the primacy of language and the formation of ontology. All these things show the relative power of science to account for reality, where before it was assumed that science would ultimately give a good account of reality. So postmodern living is living in the light of the fact that that faith has dissolved away and that we're now living in some kind of intellectual free space or fire-free zone where everything is up for grabs. And the, uh, the 20th century's fascination with the archaic, with shamanism and uh, breakdown of perception through modern art, exploration of the unconscious through psychoanalysis, mass political movements, all of these things relate to this fascination with the archaic, which is an effort on the part of the culture to stabilize itself, because we really have, having seen the limitations of science, we have discovered we are in a small rowboat in a dark ocean, and we're being swept we know not where. So all past tradition is searched, magical traditions, alchemical traditions, lost philosophical traditions, pre-literate tribal traditions. Everything is frantically searched for a key. And while there are consoling perceptions that arise out of this search through all this other extended human knowledge, there haven't yet emerged certain answers about what is going on. This is why several people last night referred to how weird the time is, how hopeful we are with so little reason uh, on the surface to be hopeful. And uh, it's because the gelling out of this historical problem is happening right now, and it's not clear uh, what it will become. Meetings like this are efforts to uh, build an understanding of it. It doesn't appear that it's going to filter down through the transformation of institutions of control. It appears more like it's going to be some kind of proletarian uh, upwelling of a shift of point of view. Now, the 
shorthand way of saying what I just said is that we now know that we don't know anything. And things like uh, the psychedelic experience and the use of psychedelic plants throws open doorways that science was able to successfully keep closed during its heyday because they were areas where the number of variables exceeded science's power of description and therefore they said well we'll just keep driving straight ahead and we'll go up those rivers later but now that is all changed and the exploration of uh, the existential dimension of not knowingness which psychedelics makes possible is what is forming modern people I think. I mean, people who will be seen to have led lives that were relevant 50 years from now or 100 years from now. People who had actually figured out the context of the world they were living in and tried to come to terms with it. And um, this morning, I think we want to talk about uh, plants and how they relate to the planet. But before we do that, I want to paint a picture for you of a, of a mandala which then I will discuss later in other meetings but my notion of, of what the postmodern person's mandalic projection onto the world should be in terms of a map of understanding is a, uh, a quadrated circle in which psychedelics and feminism and cybernetics and space travel are the four parts of the circle. And in the center of the circle, looking backwards in time, there is a category that I would call conservation, which means conservation of the planet, conservation of traditional and historical knowledge, conservation of values, conservation in the sense of intelligence husbanding the planet. And when the mandala is flipped over and you look through it into the future, conservation has been replaced by art. Art is the ultimate expression of this transformation of uh, unorganized matter into ideas which human beings carry on and we carry it on in a technical mode out of necessity but in the artistic mode out of a kind of upwelling of ecstatic self-expression about the universe so conservation is the way we relate to the past and human history is seen as an object of collective artifice making in the future culminating in the notion of uh, of the flying saucer to do this we have to completely redesign our understanding of reality which in terms of practical experience will mean that reality itself will appear to be redesigned and I touched on this just for a moment last night when I mentioned plants and said how admiring I was of them because they, subs they exist on sunlight, air, and earth and that this is what we have to learn to do in order to release spirit out of the ape matrix that we're bound in and strangely enough the way this is to be done apparently is by a redefining of the nature of the biological world in relationship to this other kingdom of being which we call plants plants represent some kind of entire other dimension of existence of which we view the topological manifestation of the form but are completely occluded as to the network of energy and information that this represents and like the zoological kingdom which has uh, thousands of forms of expression and, and progressively more complex forms which culminate in self-reflecting primates the vegetable kingdom seems to have intelligent species 
and gradations of awareness in the world so that we are opening a dialogue at the end of history with this other form in the biosphere which we are just beginning to cognize as our own understanding about what the world is really about falls into focus and certainly a hundred years ago no one would have thought that this was in the direct line of historical development of the high-tech civilizations that they would have to explore the mind of the vegetable plant goddess who was the only force contending with them for control of the planet that's what it's come down to when you take a longer slice you realize that the individual the existence of the individual is like an illusion and that really the planet is involved in some kind of chemical process which is like a gene swarming and it's been going on for a billion years with more and more and, and animals and plants uh, as species and as individuals are just uh, aggregates of genes of varying degrees of permanence the individual is a very impermanent aggregate of genes the species has a slightly longer duration but what's really happening is these information transferring molecules are just swarming on the surface of the planet and controlling as you mentioned the weather the chemistry of the soils the rate of heat transfer they've discovered now that plankton control weather in the oceans by controlling the surface reflectivity the question I think is the peculiar dualism in the world of information why does it seem that reality is not reality why are there co-present actually two worlds are co-present in our experience this is the taboo subject that we're here to talk about the weird fact that there are two worlds one of which our culture doesn't acknowledge but we all experience that's a very uh, schizophrenic situation to be in we all exist in both of these worlds but our language our culture our institutions tell us no there's only one world we have gotten into this lethal cul-de-sac where by not acknowledging the second world we have uh, have veered off on a tangent which is uh, threatens our extinction now this obsession with control of world one matter energy and the complete ignoring of the world of consciousness which stood in front of it and manipulated it but just taking that as a given has created this fantastically imbalanced culture I think that gets back to the plants as teachers because uh, since we do as in your words play with fire as human beings perhaps the question you were asking as to the plants as being teachers my feeling was at the time was they're in communication with us as we are in communication with them we're all transparent beings you're talking genes swarming on the planet there's no um, safe in which we lock our own human knowledge it's we're transparent to all around us and uh, if you get into intelligent plants which is what we were talking about earlier perhaps I mean if you follow that logically out why not have teachers as chemicals that's mm -hmm. how they can manifest within this particular body and do his library card as you were words. Mm -hmm. they realize that we're doers and shapers well I think there's only one life on the planet though and to say that we're separate from the plants or from this or from the air is a fallacy so yeah. that's a great image the growing transparency that's that's a good idea for what the end of history is mm -hmm. it's that everything becomes clearer and clearer and clearer and as it becomes clearer boundaries disintegrate and everything is seen to be of the same uh, of the same stuff well, I think for much of the world um, and still for instance in the Amazon and other cultures were tuned into nature it was very transparent for very very long progress was the losing of that transparency and the you know forging ahead of certain parts of it and and almost to the point of just either eliminating uh, to extinction or to the extinction of memory the 
the lessons. One day, I was just, I think I was doing bookkeeping or something very mundane, and um, the, uh, the little voice that in- interrupts every once in a while said, um, a plant teacher is a teacher who has taken the form of a plant. And then that raised all these questions for me, you know, because does that mean there are teachers floating around looking for places to land, right, and ways to interface with the other species? Or And, and you know, I mean, I've always thought of rocks, big rocks in many places in the world. You can sit on them and you can just hear them, you know, and feel them. <laughs> really. I'm sure you're, you know Rupert Sheldrake's theory. Well, it's basically the idea that things of like kind resonate together. And uh, when I've thought about this problem before, about LSD and where does it fit into all of this, LSD is in, uh, is in the morning glories of central Mexico and the far Pacific. And I think that what makes a plant teacher complex is how many people it's taken and that a plant that has been used a hundred thousand years is filled with all of the contents of the minds of the people who took it over that time but I want to introduce the notion that life the plants and the animals are intrusions into three-dimensional space of some kind of topological manifold of a higher order. You see, the way in which a chair differs from a giraffe is that if you, if you slice through the chair and then come back and examine it 12 hours later, it will be the same, but the giraffe will have changed radically. This is because by cutting into the giraffe, you have intruded into the temporal dimension of its existence. It is more like a musical note than an object. It must be born, grow, mature, and die. And that process, growth, maturity, and death, is how three-dimensional beings like ourselves describe the intrusion of these hyper-dimensional vortices into our world. That's the mystery of life cannot be encompassed in three dimensions. Life is a hyper-dimensional object. All hyper-dimensional objects are organisms, whether they be societies or animals. So the question of what is the plant You know, when you ask yourself, what am I, what you immediately concentrate on is your, what philosophers call your internal horizon of transcendence. You look into yourself to understand yourself. When we try to describe a plant, we inevitably give a topological mapping of it how it appears to us, its uptake of minerals, its surface reflectivity, its weight. But the plant obviously experiences itself very differently. All life has an internal horizon of transcendence toward which it aims. It's, um, Whitehead called it appetition. It's, uh, It's inclusion of sensory data out of which it maps being. But what the nature of this higher dimension is that these vortices are intruding into our dimension from is absolutely anybody's guess. I mean, you can call it a mathematical conundrum or a religious mystery, but it's what's making the world happen. It's what, how the mystery of our being will eventually be shed one more level of uh, veil to let us understand it. You see, an organism is a, a chemical system which does not run down. The, the second law of thermodynamics says that the whole universe tends toward the dissipation of structure and the release of energy and heat, and then everything, all structure, all energy is dissipated. But the uh, life has achieved the miracle of by being an open system and taking material into it and extracting energy from it and getting rid of waste, uh, life has been able to leave the main 
a stream of thermodynamic degradation and establish itself at an equilibrium point off that graph and maintain itself there for at least on this planet alone four billion years. Now the average life of a star in this galaxy is on the order of two and a half billion years. Some last longer. But that means that biology is no epiphenomenon, no iridescence off the surface of matter as the 19th century physicalists wanted to describe it. It means that life is uh, indicative of a physics of higher dimensions which intrudes into this otherwise thermodynamically degre degrading system which we call the physical universe. And uh, information, there seems to be an informational ghost of this universe, which is somehow co-present at all points within the matrix, perhaps a la Bell's theorem or something like that. And that's what the psychedelic experience shows you. It shows you a hologrammatic space of information, where by sitting still in your room and sending the mind, you can cross the universe in an instant, you know, and return. And the question of, is this real, is in bad taste. <laughs> it, it violates the two ontological categories, you see. I, I mean, uh, it just isn't done. <laughs> but, you're right. <laughs> and, but the plants seem to be the things which shake us out of these cultural conventions. We have this very bad habit of... Uh, of when we encounter a new experience, we describe it. And as we describe it, we erase its reality reduce it. and replace it with a map. And forever after, when we encounter that input, we access the map and overlay it over the thing and say, ha, oh, I know what this is. And, and so by the time a child is five years old, they have completely entered into a symbolic construct which hides the real world from them. And uh, fortunately, uh, these plant teachers seem to have the unique ability of showing you the relativity of language, which for us is the relativity of being. And then you are freed because you have seen something incontrovertible. There's no going back then. You know, you are, that is the great first gateway on the path to realize the relativity of language and the, and the malleability of, of, of the world. Coming out into the desert is uh, typical of people seeking visions. The first thing you have to do is leave the polis. Culture is this effort to hold back the mystery and in replace it with a mythology, at which is then in the control of those who recite that mythology, whether they be shamans or priests, this holding back of reality is the strain, is what Christian theo theologians call the fall. Our strange alienation from nature that causes us to crowd into cities and mint money and uh, put a price on everything. And this is why it's so important to go back to the Amazon and Eastern Indonesia and these places and try and understand what spark it was that those people kept, you know, over the millennia while we became the prodigal son and wandered into matter and, uh, you know, hoard in the cities on the plain and have now come full circle and returned at the end of history with the dilemma that we have made such a mess of things that there's nothing we can do now but lay each stage is a greater distancing from the wellspring of being and it's brought us you know to the valley of dry bones to the valley of the apocalypse and uh, now the fat is in the fire. Now we'll find out what stuff man is made of as uh, the chickens come home to roost. <laughs> but, well, no, I, I'm very optimistic. I just... <laughs> is it my metaphors or my pessimism? Oh, the horrible metaphors. The metaphors. <laughs> I'm used yes, to the Yes, well, <clears throat> the... Uh, 
rhetorical hyperbole, <laughs> unbridled. <laughs> <laughs> That's the question about this, uh, this two little thing. Because, um, it interests me greatly. Do you think that there's two worlds or that there's um, many, many worlds? Yes, well, I, I think you're right. I mean, but there are different orders of different worlds. I mean, I, I guess it was the physicist Wheeler who thought that every time there was a choice, the universe took both paths and had always done this <laughs> so that the number uh, and kinds of universes was, uh, you know, staggering. Right. I don't, I, I find that cumbersome. <laughs> and, uh, but there certainly seem to be a number of, of universes, and there seem to be different kinds of universes. For instance, uh, you can tune from channel to channel, but some of them you can't make heads nor tails out of, you know? It's just too far away from your conceptual schema for you to be... So it's sort of like watching uh, ideological mandalas or something. You can't say much about it afterwards, but it certainly was compelling while it was going on. And, uh, well, I don't know, Robin. You've, you're such a skillful questioner. You've brought yourself to the doorway of my most recent mania. Maybe I should unburden myself briefly about it. <laughs> One of the weird things about, about growth or trying to make your ideas always become new is that you always assume you're going to, uh, to uh, know what the next step is. That even though you're going to become more and more enlightened, there won't be any surprises. In, and uh, <laughs> so a few weeks ago I was meditating in my usual fashion and uh, <laughs> I began to get this new idea which was so weird that I immediately shifted into aha uh -huh, this is this is not the truth this is not a transmission about the nature of reality this is a plot for a science fiction novel that I, <laughs> that I should write and try to hold that as the defense. That was my shield against the onslaught of this thing. And I've never been one for Atlantis or Lemuria or all these invisible prehistoric lands and places that people enjoy so much. But I was told a very funny thing, which I will share with you. It's... Uh, a funny idea. Now let's see, how does it go? It has two versions, one of which speaks a scientific language, the other speaks a mythological language. Okay, so the scientific language goes like this. There's something in the universe called a fractal soliton of improbability. This means it's a unicate event. It only happens once in the lifetime of a universe. You can think of it as a wavelength with one wave. That's why it's called a soliton. And if one of the and these things move not in ordinary three-dimensional space, but, but in some kind of much higher spatial manifold, and when they collide with a planet, or when one collides with a planet in a universe, the time stream of that planet is divided and two copies of the entire planet spring into existence without either having any knowledge of it. It just is something which happens. So this voice was telling me that uh, this had happened to the Earth and that this was the secret that we were all striving to understand was that a, an event in the past had actually divided our time stream and that a twin of this planet had come into being in another dimension. Okay, so that's the scientific explanation of it. So the mythological explanation was that, there, that the universe, it's Gnostic, that the universe is the creation of a demiurge, not the highest expression of divinity, but a kind of demon, a fallen creature and that this demiurge was able to coax itself into being 
and actually incarnate into history as a human being and that when this happened this was then the mythological expression of the fractal soliton of improbability and when it happened the time stream split the universe is the creation of the demiurge and the demiurge impelled itself in in the form of an individual right and this is sort of you know waited a long time when you're a demiurge <laughs> who can hurry <laughs> okay go ahead okay so so the time splitting event had to do with the career of christ who was an extraordinary manifestation of energy in the historical time stream not to be confused with a buddha or a mohammed or a zoroaster who were great saints and uh, it, it was something else it was in some sense what it claimed to be but in some sense okay so now at the moment of and you can choose either the immaculate conception or the resurrection depending on which side of the bed you got up on today but at that moment the time stream split and this other place came into being without having any awareness that and they were identical at that moment these two worlds now Christ had no children so oh what I forgot to say was that the event the fractal soliton of improbability has this quantum mechanical half charge so that in one of the universes it happens in the other universe it doesn't happen and so everything about these two worlds was the same except that in one of them the immaculate conception had not taken place or the resurrection had not taken place now because Christ had no children in the world when which he was absent it was not a genetic line which was missing it was an ideological line which never received expression and consequently as time passed first decades and then centuries the absence of this particular intellectual influence in the world changed the world radically in the following way greek science did not suffer the suppression that occurred with the conversion of constantine the academies were not closed the hermetic knowledge was not repressed conversely the empire was stronger and was able to repel the barbarian invasions of the second to the fifth century and and mathematics which had halted in our world at diophantus proceeded through his disciple hypatia to develop a calculus by ad 370 so that the millennium of christian stasis that occurred in our world did not occur in that world and as time passed and engineering advances occurred by around 850 they had ships which were able to cross the atlantic ocean and they encountered the mayan civilization reaching its fullest flower on in guatemala and on the yucatan peninsula and in fact in this vision i saw the roman emperor cosmodorus the fifth make a pilgrimage to tikal in 920 to be present at the coronation of a king at the end of baktun eight <laughs> anyway this greco-roman imperial culture immediately recognized the genius of the mayans in mathematics and astronomy and and europe was transformed into a, an amalgamation a greco-mayan civilization with the uh, <laughs> so let me see <laughs> and and this civilization continued to develop now one of the influences which the mayans brought into europe around the year 950 was their extremely sophisticated psychopharmacopoeia and shamanism 
and this mated with Neoplatonism and Hermeticism so that rather than science developing as it developed in our world a kind of magical psychopharmacolytic technology of thought and understanding was what was developed over the centuries and then in later centuries centuries before it happened in our world they contacted the Orient and the Sung, the dynastic influence of the Sung, poured itself into the creation of a global civilization such that by around 1200 AD, they were able to land on the moon and create a cybernetic global civilization similar to the kind we have now. They continued evolving with all this psychotronic and shamanically derived and now, by this time, you can imagine it was an unbelievably exotic and alien uh, civilization compared to our own. The fruits of their psychedelic and psychoanalytic investigations into higher space was the discovery of our world. They found out <laughs> what had happened. <laughs> they figured it out by studying dreams and by making deep journeys into the psychedelic space they were able to discover our sleeping unconscious with its repository of the legacy of the Christian centuries under the reign of this demiurgic ideology and they conceived of the notion of saving us and it, it has to do with this whole thing about the UFOs and influence in dreams and astral traveling and the other side is actually the manifestation of this bizarre Greco-Mayan postmodern star-faring civilization trying to reach across the dimensions to save us from the momentum of our history by making us aware of first of all their existence and also their technology which is evolving toward a point where I think around the Mayan millennium around 2012 the time island will be f we will flow past the time island and the two time streams will be rejoined and we will make peace with this civilization which is now a thousand years more advanced than us with this totally different cultural history and this completely different take on reality so this came to me in the space of about 15 seconds <laughs> <laughs> and uh, more details have flowed in and I use it mostly as a meditational device because it's so interesting to ask to be told about how this other civilization developed its amazing exoticism you know its neoplatonism its Taoism its Mayan influences melded into a completely different kind of civilization than the one that we inherited I've always thought you know that the that uh, Christianity without making any judgment about Christ himself that Christianity is hands down the single most reactionary force in all of human history and where would we be had that 1200 years not been given over to this peculiar meditation you know all the pieces were in place for the kind of civilization that I've outlined it was just uh, a coincidence. Cat <laughs> does not uh, endorse this idea <laughs> or <laughs> even encourage it. <laughs> he only told it to me a couple of days ago in Apache Junction in a truck stop or something. You know, and, and he didn't tell me it as the plot for a science fiction novel. He said, this is the truth. And then I said, let's get back to it being a good science fiction novel. <laughs> well, the thing is that it, it would, on our level, explain perhaps the questions you were asking earlier of why the teaching plants. Yeah, sure. Yeah. The, the, uh, 
Uh, another thing I was curious while you were talking about this is the, the physics of nowadays. You know, it's like if you have an electron on one side of the universe and split it into two and separate them by the universe, they're still in communication with each other. So is that why, logically, you can bring the time island back together again? Yeah, this would be a quantum mechanical super macrophysical Bell's theorem event, a, yeah, kind, of, yeah. a kind of hyperdimensional vacuum fluctuation where the two worlds spring apart, sail along for a period, and then parity is conserved and they're rejoined. Well, know. this is interesting. I've had dreams that yeah. are parallel, what you're describing really here, like and that. it's very interesting that you're bringing this up. I've not heard of it before. And, uh, uh, <laughs> it's a if, if, it, another thing I was curious is, like, this takes place in, you know, uh, this would be on a human experience level, uh, what you're speaking of. Now, the, the plant kingdom, would they remain in... Uh, Connection between the, the species. Uh, We're free like, to have it any way we like. <laughs> <laughs> so it's how has Christianity possibly affected the evolution of plant species in this time stream, well, as opposed we, to the other? Have they gone on I, very how, how does our lack of, say, 100,000 or million species in the last 200 years mm -hmm. that the other planet has, how does that affect the parity between the two? Uh, you mean, how does our destruction and contort... Exactly. Well, the part of the myth that I didn't tell you, which I will now tell you, was uh, that uh, naturally, well, they were developing and exploring technical options many hundreds of years ago, and they... Uh, Theoretic, they discovered the theoretics for nuclear fusion and fission, but they never used it until... A few hundred years later, one of their great theoreticians, this was after they had discovered our time stream, made the prediction that the physics of atomic explosions were such that they would cross the time stream. And so they performed an experiment by detonating an atomic device in what is our year 1907. And this was yes, the, Tunguska, <laughs> the Tunguska event. And then by monitoring the dreams of Siberian shaman, which they had in clear focus, they saw, aha, this explosion which we set off actually did occur in both time streams. And at that point, they became very interested in monitoring our uh, time stream because they were picking up the dreams of a Swiss telegraph worker who seemed to <laughs> be pushing toward an unimaginable conclusion. So now there is a certain amount of urgency because if we explode our atomic stockpiles, it will wreck the place that they call home world. Butter. Yes. Yes, not self-preservation, because they now have star flight and encompass many systems, but preservation of home world, which on the other side is a vast botanical and ecological preserve from pole to pole. I mean, it's a sacred site of pilgrimage. It's uh, the, the home of the species. It's the earth. And the notion that suddenly great parts of it will be blown apart by leakage from hyperspace of one of our atomic wars is impelling them now to attempt to open the doorway and rejoin the time streams and will be allowed a few years inside the botanical park to acclimate and then most people will ship off for the stars, I imagine. The British science fiction writer Ian Watson has a wonderful book called Chekhov's Journey in which he talks about the Tunguska event and his theory is that it was a catastrophic failure of a Soviet time travel experiment conducted shortly after the turn of the next century. <laughs> Tough one to prove, right? <laughs> Obviously. Why well, didn't we think of that? <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm not sure. I've thought of that before. You know, it's the claim of Christian theologians that Christ comes in the center of history. They speak this same language. Before Christ, no souls were entering heaven. He freed the valve, and now it's possible to enter into heaven. Before his intercession, that was impossible. He 
you're right, but that's where I left them, was pre-Vatican II. <laughs> Before I had this idea, I had another idea, which I'll tell you, which is a completely different kind of idea. And it's the idea that uh, there is an overmind. This doesn't involve other dimensions. There is an overmind co-present on this planet. And uh, when technology, when the development of technology exceeds the development of ethics, then this overmind can work miracles. And because the overmind is plugged into each of the individual minds that compose it, this miracle always has this unbelievably creepy quality of being exactly the thing which would convince you to change your mind. I mean, in other words, it's like it reads you so perfectly that it's able to present the one situation which you cannot refuse. So in the case of Rome, it was that, you know, Rome was a pigsty. Uh, Pasternak called it a bargain basement on two floors. It ran on slavery and it ran on brutality and captive populations and an outrageous uh, garrisoning of military power in foreign lands. And uh, it, people like Diophantus, this mathematician I mentioned, and, and a hero of Alexandria, these people were on the brink of the calculus and the steam engine. So the Overmind, seeing that and seeing their appalling ethical uh, state, sent the miraculous personage of Christ who in a world where information could not move faster than a horse's gallop this religion within 60 years was beating at the gates of Rome itself it was like a fire you know just burned through the empire and changed everything and halted technical advance and everything Stopped. Now, I created this idea in an effort to explain the UFOs because, you know, the new theory of UFOs or the new school of UFOs says we've been wrong to ask what are they. That has not been fruitful. What we should be doing is asking what are they doing? And we can analyze what they're doing in the same way that we can analyze what anybody is doing through sociological polling of human populations. We can find out what the flying saucers are doing. So they polled human populations, and what they discovered is that what the flying saucers are doing is they are sowing disbelief in science. They cause people to not believe in scientists because scientists come up so lame when asked to explain flying saucers. It's like it is to, it is the, conf the flying saucer is the confounding of, of science in the same way that the resurrection was the complete confounding of Greek stoicism and, and uh, Democritean materialism in the Roman world. And it's conceivable, you know, that the flying saucer, I mean, the statistics are now something like 12, 11% of the American population have seen a flying saucer. 52% uh, believe flying saucers are real, whatever that <laughs> may mean, and uh, so forth. So it is a, a faith which is percolating up from the lower levels. It's people who live in trailer courts and read Fate magazine who are the staunchest uh, believers in this thing. But what it may be is an intercession on the part of the overmind, which it can do anything. It can do anything from our point of view. And in, in the most extreme version of this idea, I said, what if enormous spacecraft were to fall into orbit around this planet and what if television images of this craft were to be beamed into every home on the planet and then a teaching revealed some completely mind-boggling thing which you could have thought of it yourself but you never did <laughs> which is always how these things are and and then sud and then after 30 days of uh, melting the nuclear arsenals and causing all cancer to appear and curing all infectious diseases and delivering this message the enormous spacecraft disappeared 30 days <laughs> so then everybody says my god we have been abandoned 
we have been abandoned again into time and you know history would halt everybody would do nothing but study the teachings of the saucer and try and figure out how we could get right with them to get them to come back <laughs> dogmatism theories of communication mm -hmm. priestcraft the whole thing so you see though i'm fascinated by the flying saucer and the and what it says about the malleability of mind and matter i think mature civilizations should not be haunted by messiahs or flying saucers that these things are like metaphysical spankings imposed from on high that are designed saying you know here it's a boot in the tail wake up you know stop repressing well let's take your two ideas <clears throat> it's neither one of them is that old and what does the overmind have to do with or think of the double time stream well now that's a question I never would have asked <laughs> <laughs> you mean if that's true I sort of think of these as mutually well, exclusive. Well, there's two theories. The earlier one was that the overmind was injecting forces of change or conservative conservatism into the world. The other that events that came from now that was from the demiurge. Is mm. the demiurge related to the overmind? No, I think the demiurge is like a negative expression of but the. But created the universe. How did the overmind get in there to be running the? Earth, at least. Well, I think of the overmind as the logos. You know, it's the it's the understanding and self-existence which permeates everything. And the demiurge is the force of matter and time and cosmic destiny that is always trying to lock in the logos and condition it and make it subject to the rules of the of the physical universe of space and time. And the logos is like something from. This is all Gnostic theology, by the way. This is just straight from the book. The logos is trying to struggle through the labyrinth of the material universe to escape, to rejoin the real source of itself, which is outside of matter. Matter is viewed as a, a, an entrapment. Uh, if any of you have read the late works of Philip K. Dick, he was probing in these areas. He was a genius. His book, Valus, is pure exegesis of his internal uh, he unravelment of what was going on. And he believed, his take on it was, he believed that from A.D. 69 until 1948, no time had actually passed, and that we were living in apostolic time and that the crucifixion lay only 75 years in the past and that the demiurge had inserted a false history and the Nag Hammadi manuscripts he believed were actually the logos as printed letters and that when the when the Nag Hammadi manuscripts were deciphered it was like this informational creature would come alive and again be present on the earth that the logos beginning in 1948 was beginning to infuse everything and that shortly it would dissolve the illusion of the intervening 1860 years or whatever it was and then we would realize that the prophecy would be fulfilled and that the last days were upon us that's right that's right he didn't get around to the Antichrist, uh, to his credit, probably. <laughs> you have to distinguish between Christ, the person, the teacher, and this thing called the Christos, which is this archetype of such power and force that immediately people of ill intent could get lined up behind it and uh, impose their will. Yeah, sell love and sell forgiveness, and uh, you know what? What a scam! And and the the Christos is the thing. History is ruled by the archetypes which people can generate. I mean, uh, most people are very ordinary. I mean, your Mick Jaggers and your Henry Kissingers, they're very ordinary people, but they are able to project an archetype, you know, and that is the thing 
which sets them sets them apart and and when that reaches the kind of super intense focus that you get in a Muhammad or a Christ well then you know history is just uh, putty in the hands of the force not the person the person is usually martyred in some <laughs> horrible way but the 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 archetype take draws energy to itself and to, and we don't understand how this process works if there ever is developed by benevolent or malevolent forces a science of social control it will be a science of knowing how to project archetypes and 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 different archetypes apparently are suitable to different times I mean you could almost posit an astrological theory of archetypes but it's something about how you know what's appropriate for uh, the first century AD is not appropriate for the 15th uh, but when the archetype is appropriate nothing can stop it we what the modern term for archetypes is paradigm and we expect it not to be a person not a messiah but an idea which will save us all in which then gives us certain affinities with mystical judaism where the messiah was seen was expected in the form of an idea and this is sort of our faith we're messianic ideologues or something like that uh, oh i agree with you i think ultimately all dualisms have to be dissolved in the in the notion that you know there is one thing i mean that's the platonic faith the problem is all these secondary and tertiary operational levels <laughs> where you know we're trying to actually operate in a universe of scarcity in a body which requires energy and all these things uh, this is this is really the central problem in in western thinking i think is the tension between dualism and unity and matter and spirit and how do you handle it uh, i think you know that we are spiritualizing matter this is what technology is and that the spiritualizing of matter is uh, the highest expression of our technological output and that this will become more and more what we are about so that in the next century the difference between mind and brain and cell and machine will all have been subsumed under a new vocabulary because we are hardwiring our minds and we are making the artifacts of our culture intelligent and we are breaking down the barriers between ourselves between ourselves and larger data bases and this kind of thing so that the old i'm an ego inside the skin definition it gives way to some kind of much more malleable and plastic thing well, as an astrologer one of the images that i like is the, the symbol for pisces which is two lines with a line going through it and it's it's the definition of relationship quality by opposition it's polarity it's right wrong good bad male female russians americans the aquarium one which is the, the two lines of, of waves over each other is one of resonance and it's one of dolphins jumping in the water together it's one of of people coming together and realizing like how i resonate with you and what i have to give you and you have to give me but you'll have something to give me that other people can't and so on and we need to to swim together and that breaks down all of the the dualist bonds that, that and I think we're right at that that crux right at the moment and that place between Pisces and Aquarius where we're kind of two worlds again flipping from one side to the other of opposition being torn from life and death and and seeing uh, for, as the Christ I feel was that 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 prototype that that um, template of light and spirit with matter coming together and saying I can dance in this and I can leave it and I can come back into it I have this power it's my conscious compassionate love that is just so unbounded that it gives me the opportunity to to play in clay if I choose much of what I say is Alfred North Whitehead his philosophy and believe me if you're looking around for a serious ontological foundation you don't have to read sanskrit uh, alfred north whitehead will serve very admirably science in the modern world process and reality he, the, he was he was and remains the great psychedelic philosopher of the 20th century and the heir of bergson
You had another question. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm going to be 84 in the year 2012, and I'm wondering how best to, <laughs> to manage my life so that I'll be ready for that. <laughs> I'm present. Well, I don't know. I think that the, wa the canyons of the Creo down which we are, as individuals are moving, those walls are getting higher and higher, too. A lot of times when I had these co intense contacts with the teaching entity, I would have an anxiety about what, is, what should I do? What is it for me to do? And it always said, nothing. Relax. You know, your function is, is to just, uh, you'll be present where you're necessary. Oh. And I really, uh, this isn't a fatalism, this is a kind of recognition of the dynamics of time that the thing is trying to teach, you see. It's trying to say that if you understand how process works, you will always understand where you are in any given process, and then you won't have anxiety about not occupying some other point in that process, you know. <coughs> But when I began having these ideas, the only way I could previously relate to the notion of the end of the world was that I had a head full of cartoons of bearded men in sandals carrying signs on street corners mm -hmm. saying, repent, repent. And here was I, you know, former Marxist, former this, former that, espousing these unimaginable things. But it's always good to do your homework. And I discovered there's a wonderful book called The Pursuit of the Millennium by uh, Norman Cohn, in which he s details the history of millenarianism. That's what this phenomenon is, the uh, belief by a person or a group of people that the end of the world is about to occur. And uh, it, uh, it existed among the Jews of the post-exilic period, it's part of the phenomenon or it's part of the social expectation that gave Christ his entree. Uh, the early patristic Christians lived in the eminent expectation of the end of the world. And then during the medieval period, the, the most uh, utopian, prophetistic, millenarian movement before Marxism was uh, Floraism or the fo people who followed the teachings of Joaquin of Flora, who was uh, a wandering monk who, who predicted uh, the end of the world. Uh, I, let's see, I think for 1244, and he died in 1222. And, and, but his followers carried on, and the Pope had to send out armies to, for, to quell uprisings as people wanted to distribute the wealth because they felt the end of the world was upon and why should anybody go to work and uh, you know this sort of thing similarly in the year 1000 there was great expectation that of Christ's eminent return so this is a thing which the human mind in, at least in its Western expression seems to seek to do Islam too has its apocalypses so, 1967 wasn't bad. I mean, I thought it was happening. I thought we were months away from a new secular order for the ages. But um, my theory of history views these things not as evidence against such a thing occurring, but as evidence that it will occur, that these uprisings and outbreaks of irrational expectation of the millennium are in fact temporal reflections. They are catching the light on the temporal prism from the object at the end of history which contains the apocalyptic uh, scenario. Uh, it's very important to manage the apocalypse and the millennium. It's very important that people not confuse the cleansing flames of transcendence with the ability to use thermonuclear weapons against your ideological enemies. It's a very delicate matter because uh, our mythologies and our fears run so deeply. But I think that it's an awareness of this potential 
of the existence of this law of temporal compression. And of course, institutions don't promote millenarianism because institutions want people to invest their money at low interest and long term and uh, not and have the expectation that everything will carry on pretty much as it has. But uh, an examination of the last 500 or 1,000 years of human history would lead anyone, I think, to the conclusion that everything is going to be swept away and everything that replaces it is going to be swept away and that we are just moving into an era of change which might as well be called apocalyptic and must be made millenarian. <coughs> Otherwise, it will just end in some kind of Gotterdammerung and, and uh, the worst boogeyman of Western culture will emerge.